My name's Rhonda Berkheimer. I am a person in long-term recovery from substance use disorder. I have almost nine years of recovery. I started my journey when I was probably 13 years old. Um, I lived in the country. Um, we didn't have a lot of activities to do. So uh, there was a lot of time spent on back roads and cornfields, um, partying. We would drink. Um, then I started smoking pot. Um, probably by the time I was 14 years old. One of the first times that I had had um, a drinking episode where my parents found out, I had been at a friend's house um, and I had drank so much that um, I blacked out. So I did not go home that night. I stayed all night with that person. Um, made it home the next day and um, my mom and dad were uh, extremely upset, you know, at what had happened. Um, so they then put me into a 28-day drug and alcohol treatment program. Um, I was 14 years old um, in the city uh, and had drank one time. Um, so that was my first experience with even hearing the word addiction or alcoholic. Um, that was really just not influential to me at all. I went right back home and went right back to doing what I was doing before I went there. Um, I continued down the road with pills, um, acid, mushrooms, um, lots of drinking, smoking pot. Um, around the time of 17 um, is when I first tried cocaine. That wasn't um, something that I did daily, uh, but I did it whenever it was available. Um, after high school, I was with a boyfriend of mine who later turned into my husband. Um, he was also somebody that used drugs regularly and drank a lot. Um, him and I together started using cocaine regularly um, and did this for several years with no consequence. We um, had our own house, we were raising his daughter, uh, we had stable jobs, paying our bills. Everything was, was normal, we felt. Um, and then out of the blue, um, I got really, really sick. Couldn't get out of bed. Didn't really know what was going on. Um, I ended up going to my parents' house um, where I just kind of slept for a couple of days and just just slept, I couldn't get up, I couldn't do anything. Um, my parents were concerned, so they took me down to the hospital, had some testing done. Um, the hospital um, realized that I had had a stroke. They ran more testing, um, could not figure out what caused me to have the stroke. Um, so they decided that they would send me to Cleveland Clinic from Cincinnati Hospital. So I was transported by the ambulance from Cincinnati to Cleveland and my parents followed. Um, and then on the way to Cleveland Clinic, I had a second stroke. Um, the second stroke was way more severe than the first stroke. So when my parents got to Cleveland um, and they saw me, um, they were really, really shocked because I had um, residual effects from the second stroke that I didn't have when I left the hospital in Cincinnati. Um, so they were, they were pretty terrified and, you know, still we didn't know what was going on, what was causing these. Um, 
So I was in Cleveland Clinic for a couple of months, a lot of testing and seeing a lot of different doctors. Um, we came to the conclusion that the strokes were caused from uh, cocaine-induced vasculitis. Um, vasculitis is an autoimmune condition, um, and the cocaine just exasperated that condition and caused me to have two strokes. Um, I was 24 years old. Um, like I said, I was raising a little girl, had a family, two jobs, a house. Um, but these strokes, uh, they, they took all that away. While in Cleveland Clinic, um, I had to do physical therapy, occupational therapy in a skilled nursing facility. Um, I had to learn how to take care of myself. I had to learn how to walk. I had to learn how to use my left arm. I, I had to learn how to do everything for myself again. Um, and I was 24. Again, I was 24 and had been raising a little girl. So it was hard for me to wrap my mind around the fact that I couldn't take myself to the bathroom or that I couldn't shower myself. Um, but my parents came up from Cincinnati regularly to see me, spend time with me, support me. Um, and after I completed my stay at the, uh, the, um, the skilled nursing facility, completed my therapy, I went home to my mom's house um, I didn't go back with my husband because my husband continued to use drugs, um, and I knew my strokes were caused by my drug use, um, so I didn't want to put myself around that. Um, now, throughout all this stroke treatment that I had at Cleveland, um, addiction was never talked about, although they knew that I had been using cocaine, um, and at one point at Cleveland Hospital, I had actually snuck out to the garage to smoke a joint one time. They knew all this, but nobody talked about addiction while I was there, so it wasn't on my mind at all. I knew the strokes were caused by cocaine use, but addiction wasn't on my mind. So I went home to live with my mom. She helped take care of me um, in the beginning. Um, I was also put on OxyContin while I was in Cleveland because the strokes uh, left me with some pain. I was very uncomfortable, I was in pain. Um, so I was put on OxyContin. So I'm at mom's house and I'm doing physical therapy to help build the strength in my legs. Um, I'm seeing all these doctors for follow-up for all these medical conditions that I developed from the strokes. Um, and I'm taking oxys all the time. Um, so a couple of months, maybe six to eight months after living with my mom, I realized that these pain pills were a problem. I, would, I just was eating them all the time. I was snorting them. Um, I still didn't really know anything about addiction. Still wasn't thinking about addiction. I just knew it was a problem went to the doctor and told him, you know, this is a problem. I'm not taking the medication for pain anymore. Um, I'm just taking it to get high. Um, so he said, okay, all right, thank you for telling me, and we won't prescribe these anymore. So that was the end of that. Um, I thought I thought I was doing what I needed to do, telling him he would stop them. I'd be okay. Um, that is not what happened. I was sick. Um, I didn't want to stop taking them. I wanted more. Um, so I just went out and found some pills. Um, it was actually way more easier than what I thought it was going to be. Um, so that's what I just decided I was going to do for now. I was just get pills on the, the streets and just keep taking my pills. Um, that quickly led me to be in a relationship with somebody that had those pills at their disposal, um, which just supported my habit and my want for for the high. Um, 
So after probably a couple of years of doing these pills, um, things, you know, grew in our county and heroin was becoming available and the person that I was with had done heroin before, even though we were just on pills. Um, that was something he had had before. Um, so one day we, we just got it. It was cheap. We got it. Um, I said what most addicts say, I'm not going to put a needle in me, I'm just going to snort it. I'm not one of those people that six needles in them. Um, so we got it, we did it, um, I snorted it, uh, it, I went in half hour later and I went and got a needle and, and shot it because, um, snorting it did nothing for me. Um, and he was shooting it, so um, it was that fast, 30 minutes maybe, and I put a needle in me. Um, so after a couple of years of being on heroin, um, spending my whole day, every day, um, involved with heroin in one way or the other, um, I had been fighting with Social Security to stay on disability. Um, at this point, I'd probably been on disability for six years. Um, Social, Social Security was doing a review hearing on me, reviewing the criteria to see if I still qualified to be disabled and beyond benefits. Um, I was in full-blown active addiction, and I thought, um, I'll be damned if you're taking my Social Security from me. I'm disabled and I'm not working. Um, so I paid and got an attorney and fought it for two years um, to the point to where we finally had a, um, our final hearing in front of um, Social Security. And um, I went in very, very nervous that I could lose these benefits. Um, but I was also very, very high and felt... <laughs> grandiose, like you can't really touch me. So I went into the uh, federal building for the hearing. Um, in the federal building, they have security officers. Um, and the security officer uh, checked my purse, searched my purse when I came in, um, which I thought was strange, but um, it was the federal building, so, you know, I didn't really question it. I handed over my purse, let him look at it. Um, I totally forgot that I had had um, heroin hidden in my uh, wallet. Um, I don't even know how long it had been there. I just forgot that it was there. So he's going through my purse. He gets to my wallet. He finds the heroin. Um, he asks, you know, what it was. I think I told him it was dissolvable aspirin. Um, and then they detained me and they took me to jail. I was charged with uh, possession of heroin. So, um, this is my first charge, you know, felony charge of any kind. Um, I was let out of jail that day with a court date. Um, I got out of jail and just went, just kept getting high. Um, went to court and, um, I was put in a drug court because of my drug charge. Um, being in drug court kind of allowed me to draw out beginning that program um, because I was prescribed Suboxone and at that time drug court did not allow people to be on Suboxone. So in order for me to enter the program, I would have to get medically discharged from the Suboxone. So um, I drew it out for, I don't know, three or four months, kept going back to court telling her I couldn't get into the doctor or just making up excuses um, just so I didn't have to start with the program, you know. Um, I finally got to a point where I, I got the note that I was medically discharged from the Suboxone that I wasn't even really taking, but I still had to have the note. Um, and I went to the court hearing knowing that day um, that 
I was, you know, going to be put into the program that day. So I got to go in front of the judge. She offered me um, intensive outpatient treatment, which is, you know, you can go back home, sign up for this treatment, and attend it three times a week, a couple hours at a time, start your program. Um, so I was a mess, and I was, uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't even know why I did this, but I was a mess. And I stood in front of her, and I told her, um, Your Honor, if you don't lock me up, I'm just going to go back and keep getting high, because that's what I do. Um, so she said, Okay, we'll just lock you up then. Um, so that's what she did. She locked me up. I um, went over to the jury box passed out because I was just that high and exhausted. So I passed out in the jury box. After court was over, they took me down, did all the stuff. I went over to the jail, um, got inside the, the pod and passed out again for probably another day almost. I was just so tired. Um, and then I started going through withdrawals. That, that was my first true experience of withdrawal without being somewhere where I knew I'd be getting it soon. Um, when you're in jail, you know you're not getting it soon. You're gonna feel it. So that was my first true withdrawal um, that I had experienced. Um, I was also still on a lot of medication from my strokes, um, all different kinds of medication, psych meds, blood pressure meds, steroids, um, anti-inflammatories, just, just a bunch of different medications. Um, and in jail, um, I didn't go in there with, with these medications. I didn't go in there with the list of these medications. So the jail has to verify the medications. Um, when I was, I had spent the first night in there. I woke up the next day, I was very sick. Very sick and full-blown withdrawal. Um, didn't give two shits about my medicine. Didn't care at all about meds. Um, and because of some of the medicines I'm on, um, there's withdrawal that goes along with those if I don't take them. Um, it's not withdrawal like opiate withdrawal, but it's still um, a physical withdrawal that I experienced. So um, while I'm withdrawing from heroin, um, I'm not caring about the other medication, so I start withdrawing from the other medication also. Um, I kind of knew that some of the feelings that I was having was because of a certain medication that I hadn't had. Um, and so I started trying to convey that to the corrections officers. Um, they really didn't know what I was talking about. They didn't have documentation of me being on medicine. Um, and so, and they knew that I was withdrawing from heroin. So they really just didn't pay much attention. Um, my withdrawal got pretty severe to where I did some sleepwalking in the middle of the night. I was in a pod with like a dorm style sleeping. Um, so I was walking around the middle of the night. Um, the uh, corrections officers knew this was uh, abnormal activity. So they had me taken to the medical um, pod of the jail so that I could be watched. Once over in the medical pod, I just was really going through this, this withdrawal of this other medication. Um, and I could really tell, and I kept telling them that, you know, I need my medicine, I need my medicine. They didn't have any idea what I was talking about. Um, and so I'm in this this medical pod. I'm in a cell by myself on suicide watch um, because they felt like I was crazy, but they didn't really know what was going on. So they just wanted to keep an eye on me. Um, in this cell, I'm going crazy. 
I, I don't really understand. Um, but I do remember for some reason I felt like I could break out of the jail, I, I guess. I, I don't really know because I really don't remember the exact thoughts I had. But what I ended up doing was um, flooding my jail cell with my, um, you get a, uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a padded out, outfit that you wear when you're on suicide watch. Um, so I tried to cram that outfit down my toilet, which I knew wouldn't go and would clog it up. Um, and then I proceeded to continue to flush the toilet in the attempt of flooding the cell. Um, I, I don't know really exactly why I was doing that. Um, but in the meantime, I took some toilet paper and put it over my cell door window so that the corrections officers could see in my cell. And I knew that would get them to come to my cell because um, you can't cover your window. Um, and then for whatever reason, I stood in front of my door and waited for somebody to come to the cell um, to check on me and because they were seeing water come out from under the cell door and there was toilet paper on the window. So they came to check on me and I stood by the door and as soon as they popped the lock on the door, I pushed the door open and hit the corrections officer sitting on the other side. Um, she wasn't hurt, she was knocked down on the floor. Um, I was quickly, quickly um, detained and thrown back in my cell handcuffed um, and super confused. I really didn't even understand what the hell I was trying to do. I mean, I, I was aware of what I was doing, but I, I just don't know why I was doing all that. Um, so after that event, um, I ended up getting myself uh, in trouble, I guess. I got put in the hole in jail for three weeks. Um, and drew a lot of attention to myself. At that time, I had medical come talk to me pretty in-depthly. Um, they finally realized that I, that I was on medication. They were able to contact a family member and a pharmacy and um, start getting me on those meds. Um, so by the time I had uh, finished my three weeks in the hole, I had been back to court in front of the judge and she had informed me that I was going to get a residential treatment after my punishment at the jail was over. Um, so I went back to jail, finished my punishment, um, and then I was moved over to residential treatment from jail. Um, after what I experienced in jail, I loved residential treatment. It was awesome. I had real food. I got to wear my clothes. I was smoking cigarettes. Um, so I participated in this residential treatment program, um, for roughly five to six months. Um, never once did I have the intention of not using drugs when I left there. Um, cause I still wanted to get high. I just, you know, I had to do what I had to do with the drug court. So I completed that program. Um, went back home to my mom's for a very short time, um, went out and used, and then um, went to the hotel and just laid in the hotel until finally um, my mom called the police one night because she knew I was in the hotel using, um, and she told the police I was in there trying to kill myself on heroin. So they showed up in the middle of the night knocked on the door, um, and they came in and arrested me. Um, so I had only been out of treatment for two and a half months, maybe. Um, so I went back to jail and then went back to residential treatment, the same one that I had just left from. Um, that was so hard on me because I didn't, want, I didn't want to be back in there. I didn't want to be separated from my life again. 
Um, and I felt like when I went back in there that I did not want to quit getting high. So I just, I just felt like it was a huge waste of time to go back in there. Um, I was in there for about two weeks. Um, and there was another girl that came in there that had been in the first time with me also. So we did our first time together, got out around the same time, and then went back around the same time. Um, and we, her and I became very, very close. And um, we just decided we were tired of living like that. We didn't want to just keep going back to treatment and come out and come back. And um, So we decided to take it a little more serious this time and try to do something different. Um, doing that for a little bit of time is how I developed my desire to not use anymore because the, when I went in the second time, I had a desire to use. Um, and there wasn't one specific thing that happened that took that desire away. It just happened gradually um, over a little bit of time. And then I wanted to keep doing the right thing. I wanted to continue to build my life. Um, I left treatment, went to transitional housing for a short time, kind of get on my feet a little bit. Um, and then I was able to get myself an apartment of my own um, by myself, which I had never had before. Um, and then um, from there, I just, I just kept going forward and kept moving up and up. I eventually I graduated drug court, um, maintained my sobriety after graduation, um, moved back to where I was from, um, and just started connecting with people in the community that were sober, trying to build a sober support network because my network was in the city where I did treatment. Um, I had made a connection with one of the girls I was in treatment with because she lived in the area I was from. So her and I started hanging out, started going to some meetings together. Um, right after she completed treatment, her husband passed away from a drug overdose. Um, and it hit her really hard. And she was trying to deal with that, so she found a support group for... Um, family members that had lost a loved one to an overdose. She wanted to attend the support group, and so her and I and our other best friend attended the support group um, that's known as Claremont County Solace. Um, when we attended the support group, it was a group like I'd never been in a, before. It wasn't a structured curriculum type group. It was a group of breaking hearts of family members, moms, dads, grandmas, um, brothers and sisters. It was a group of people that were just broken and trying to figure out how to support themselves, how to support their loved one or how to grieve their loved one. And something about that group um, drew me in. It, it drew me in and I felt for these people. And so I, I kept attending this group. All three of us girls kept attending this group. Um, and it became a group where we essentially could share with these family members our own personal thoughts and feelings about things that we have, may have done to our family members that we couldn't make amends for today, for whatever reason. Um, we were then making some of our amends to the family members of this group. And in turn, some of these family members were getting questions answered that they had always wondered and some of them didn't have their loved ones around anymore to answer these questions. So we, we utilized and we leaned on each other a lot in this group. Um, the parents in the group really empowered us girls 
to share our story of recovery. Um, they felt like our recovery stories um, gave them hope of what could have been for their children. And that was empowering. It was really inspiring to me. Um, they also had one of the mothers in the group had a son who lived in the city. And he had this thing of where he liked to help people that were early in recovery find recovery housing to help maintain recovery for people. Um, and that was really interesting to me. Um, I thought it was a cool concept and, you know, it was really cool to go out and help other people with something that you found helped you. So that same mother also found that our group could apply for grant money from our local mental health and recovery board that we could use to pay for people in early recovery to enter recovery housing. Um, and that was amazing because we were able to go into the jail and tell somebody that had been homeless when they went in and had been strung out on drugs when they went in, we could tell them, hey, we'll help you go to a safe place when you get out of jail where you won't use drugs and we're gonna help you pay for it. Um, we're gonna help give you a chance to the road to recovery. Um, so we started doing that and it was amazing. It was an amazing feeling to go out and help somebody that felt like they were helpless, hopeless. Um, they, they had no purpose to even continue to go on. And we were able to just help them enter a safe house and connect them to a group of safe people. Um, and that felt amazing. So after doing that for a couple of years, we had um, a woman in the community that that noticed what we were doing and noticed some of the barriers that we were running into with trying to help people that we were trying to help. Um, so she got a lot of people in the county together and just started talking, putting their heads together. And they came up with the concept of peer supporters, um, outreach people in our community. Um, and in our county supported starting up outreach positions in the county and offered to pay peers to help other people struggling in the county. Um, when, they, when they offered that to me and talked about it, it just blew my mind, the concept of they wanted to pay me, they wanted to pay me, and I, I was a heroin addict, and they wanted to pay me to go into the jail and help another addict it just blew me away and that was almost five years ago um, so around the year of 2013 um, my sister struggles with addiction her husband struggles with addiction um, and they had two younger kids um, so both my sister and her husband decided to go to residential treatment and the kids were um, then left with the neighbor to, for the neighbor to take care of. Um, I was in a better place in my life at that time, and the older of the two kids um, was about 12 years old, um, and she was a pretty responsible 12-year-old. So I felt like the right thing for me to do, the best thing for everybody involved was for me to let the older one move in with me and I would take custody of her um, until mom and dad could get back on their feet. To kind of help this neighbor out, she was 70 years old and, and they were young and a lot of, you know, a lot of energy. So I was just trying to help her out, help my niece, you know. So I did that, uh, mom and dad got out of treatment, and they did well for for a little bit um, and then they slept again um, 
So at that point, I just went and filed for full custody of my niece and obtained full custody of her. Um, last year in June of 2018, um, my nephew, who had went back to live with his mom and dad after they got out of treatment, um, had contacted the family uh, and said that um, he would like for somebody to come pick him up. He had been at some stranger's house for a couple of days. His dad had left him there. And he hadn't had any food. He didn't know where his dad was. And he just wanted somebody to come get him. So he was uh, 14 years old. Um, and we went and picked him up and brought him home. And I, I just decided that I would um, handled things with his sister pretty well for a couple of years. And uh, it was probably time, you know, tried to move him in and offer him a better life and, and, and that we'd be able to do that. So um, I took custody of him um, last year. Um, so I'm now raising a 17-year-old female and a 16-year-old male. Um, and I have no kids on myself. I chose not to because I just didn't want kids. I wanted to only worry about me. I'm, I'm selfish and I like staying up late. I like sleeping in late. I just made that choice for myself. But when it came to these kids having a better option than what they had had for 13 years of their life, um, and I felt like I had built myself up to a point to where maybe I could provide that for them, um, then I, I felt moved to go do that for them. Um, they deserved a chance to have a better life than what they were being offered. Um, and I just felt like I was in the position to help them with that. Um, since I have had custody of both of them, um, they have entered therapy for uh, PTSD. Um, they suffer with uh, the trauma of living with two active addicts. Um, that's hard when you're a kid. It's hard when you're an adult, but when you're a child, it's really, really hard because you have, you have no control over anything. You're just along for the ride. Um, so I do my best to connect my kids to the resources that they're going to need, um, to help them have a better life than what they've known before. Since then, the power that my community gives me by supporting me in trainings and, um, and, and making sure that I'm taking care of myself and, and asking questions of things that I see in the community and my feedback. Um, my community's been my biggest supporter in my last, I'm gonna say five years of recovery because um, without them, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. I wouldn't have even seen the passion that I have in myself. I wouldn't have recognized that for myself, I don't think. Um, if I didn't have people there encouraging it and supporting it and wanting more of it, basically. Um, so I'm very, very blessed today to have such a great supporting community that I'm involved with.